really embarrassing, but thank you. <laughs> um, it's really good to be here. I don't, it's weird. Usually when you travel, you feel like there's real differences between where you're from and where you are. And somehow this feels a lot like Oregon. Didn't have to pack a tie or a jacket and smell of patchouli in the air and <laughs> Dr. Bonner's. And, um, so it's good to be home. <laughs> um, so we're going we're gonna, to um, talk uh, Probably, I mean, the, the, the introduction was very kind, and, and um, I think by the end of the night, we'll go places where you weren't thinking you, we were going to go. Um, and we can do that, because I'm getting on a plane tomorrow morning. And um, <laughs> so, um, but I think it's worthwhile. The, the, the place, I mean, just the, looking at the title, you're looking at this, it's, it's a weird amalgam of, of concepts. And so what I, I want to do is kind of start globally, talk about, last week I, I understand you talked a lot about the Columbia and the, the, the legal complexities of, of this shared basin uh, that we're actually a part of. I mean, here you all are connected to us in, in Corvallis through the, the Columbia Basin. Um, and so we'll start kind of globally. Columbia is not the only international basin in the world. There's a lot of them. So I want to start globally and then really zoom in. Once you get, you get a concept for what's going on in international basins, at the end of the day, the solutions are, are brought about by small groups of people in a, in a room. And so half of my job is kind of big global overview of, of statistics and of, of understanding what 
creates conflict settings for conflict, settings for, for conflict management, uh, but the other half is, is acting as a mediator facilitator in the room. And so that, it's that second part that I really want to spend uh, the bulk of the, of the time on. But we kind of have to start talking about these numbers. I don't know if you, you all have seen these in, in other classes. We're talking about uh, global crises. The global water crisis is as big as, as any that's out there. The, the top two, malaria, HIV, AIDS, and in water resources. And you look at these numbers, two and a half billion people lack access to sanitation. A billion people lack access to safe drinking water. 250 million people get sick. Uh, two and a half million to five million people die every year. So on orders of magnitude, this is as big as any crisis out there. It's as big as HIV, AIDS, and malaria, and it's bigger than anything else. It's bigger than all the things we worry about. It's bigger than all the wars in any given year put together. It's bigger than tsunamis, earthquakes, droughts, floods, all these kinds of things pale in comparison to the destruction that, that's brought about by this crisis, so, which begs the question, why aren't we doing anything about it? Any guesses, percent, why, why don't we treat this with the severity that we do other crises? Yeah, exactly. Who are all these people suffering? Far away, right? Least an ocean separates us, right? Far away, it doesn't impact our daily lives. So in order to help those people far away, we have a foreign aid program. Foreign assistance, a percentage of our GDP is what? Any guesses? Guess we weren't, we weren't ready for interactivity, right? It's like, dude, 7 o'clock, just play the tape, <laughs> right? How about it? What percentage? Any guess. Doesn't matter if it's educated or not. 35. 35 way less. 1%. 1 less. Half a percent less. It's less than a quarter of 1% of our GDP goes to foreign assistance. And more than half of that goes to two countries alone. Name them. Israel, Israel and Egypt. Egypt. Right? So half of the quarter of our 1% of our GDP is going to these two countries and the rest is to deal with this and all the other things that we do with our, our foreign assistance. Just incidentally, the, come back to you in the corner. What percentage of our GDP goes for military expenditures? You were right. No, it <laughs> feels like it, but it's about 35, 40%. So what I want to focus on is not the magnitude of the complexity, but the political impacts of this crisis. So the politics start with what we use water for. What do we use water for? Agriculture, huge. How much of the world's water goes to agriculture? Two thirds, two thirds, two thirds. <laughs> two thirds, excellent. What else? Power generation, industry. Sanitation, running out of uses, drinking water, Coca-Cola, yeah, yeah, right? The same, right? This is Coca-Cola drinking water, right? Yeah. What else? We out of uses? It's interesting what we talk about, what comes to mind. How many, if we really thought about it, how many people know that water is at the heart of the spiritualities of most of the world's religions? Hands way up high. How many people know that? And yet, it doesn't come out. Classroom, word doesn't come out. And it's interesting. We'll talk about why we don't talk about that in a little bit. But let's look at the uses. I had a grad student um, come up with some pictures for the uses. Uh, ecosystems. We also didn't mention ecosystems. Kind of important, right? Fish don't vote, but they need water. Uh, transportation, we mentioned. Is that what we had in mind for transportation? <laughs> Uh, hydropower, we said, irrigation, agriculture, spiritual components, and of course, uh, drinking water. Now, the, the point about water management is that any two of these uses are potentially in conflict with each other. <laughs> and therefore, water management is conflict management by definition. There's never enough water for all the uses in any basin. There's always going to be competition amongst users. And so to manage water efficiently, you also have to manage, you have to manage conflict. Just the nature of the game. Now that's within one basin. If you think about water in contrast to other, other resources, it has other attributes that are frustrating. One, it moves in space and time. Right? Other resources have the courtesy to stay in one place. We don't worry too much about where the trees are going, right? where the gold is going. How much water is going to be in the Clark Fork next year? Don't know, right? And yet, Clark Fork's part of a system, an international system. We have a treaty 
that we have to manage internationally the entire basin with an entire other country and a whole bunch of other states, right? So even though we don't know how much there's going to be, it moves in space and time, we have to treat it like any other scarce resource. Nature gives us this unit from the ridge to the stream, and if we look down at a map view, what do we call that? It's a watershed, right? Watershed, or if it's British English, it's a catchment, right? Within this unit, everything's connected to everything else. Surface water, groundwater, quality, quantity, all connected. So this is the way water people see the world, through watersheds. The things that unite us, the things that bring us together. Now how about politically? What do we do with this unit? Absolutely ignore it. Draw straight lines right in the middle of it. For years, I thought the Columbia Basin had a nice straight line, the northern border, the Columbia Basin. Interesting, coincidentally, on the 49th parallel. I thought that was so cool. What a great basin. It just ended, right? Who knew? Canada? Like, <laughs> sometimes we even use the water as the boundary, the river itself as, as the boundary. Any Oregonians here? All right. Go Beavs. Any Washingtonians here? Okay, so here's an interesting fact. We love our northern neighbor, but the Columbia is migrating in geologic time northward, giving Oregon a couple of millimeters of Washington every year, and in geologic time, we will get Seattle. Okay? So here's, here's, our, here's our world, is that water people see the world this way, through the things that, that bring us together, and Political people are basically everybody else sees the world this way with the things that divide us, the boundaries that are there. And the boundaries, it's not to say one of these is right and the other is wrong. These are both very legitimate ways of seeing the world. You have to balance them. Th these boundaries are there protecting very legitimate things, sovereignties and economies and ethnicities and all the things that we construct our boundaries to do. But what boundaries do is divide. And what watersheds do is unite. So this is the world. Balancing the needs of, of the watershed with the very real boundaries that are there. And when I first started getting involved in this world back in the early 1990s, um, there were a couple of basins that people were talking about, the conflict potential they were especially focusing on. India and Pakistan, people know to share a basin. You know Sarah Halverson is here and works a bunch and was here. Hey! <laughs> um, whoa, where'd we go? I lost my basin. Uh, so, uh, in the Indus Basin, India and, ba India and Bangladesh uh, uh, share a basin. Uh, Tigris Euphrates, an especially tense basin where armies were actually mobilized in 1979 on the Iraq Syria border. The Aral Basin, where water conflict moves in one direction, the uh, uh, natural gas. Uh, conflict moves in the other direction. And then the ones, people in the early 90s were using this meme, water wars. And these are the two that they were mostly talking about. The Nile Basin had 10 at the time, now 11 uh, riparian states. Um, there's one treaty that allocates all of the water between the bottom two uh, uh, riparian, Sir uh, Sudan and Egypt, uh, divide all the water between them, conveniently forgetting about the other eight Riparians, and then Israelis and Arabs, everywhere there's an Israeli-Arab border, there's an Israeli-Arab uh, water uh, issue that, that needs resolving as well. So about this time, people were saying, look at these six case studies. There's, there's people who hate each other share a base, and we use it for everything we do. We're running out of water populations, growing climate change, and therefore, uh, people were saying things like this. Fierce competition for fresh water may well become a source of conflict and wars in the future. How many people agree? Hands way up high. Yeah, it's a compelling argument. You're, it's there. We're running out of water. And look at the tensions. And look at the people who share. And Arabs and Israelis and Indians and Pakistanis. And so the trick in the, in the early 90s, I was also drawn to this argument. But, but as you heard in this generous introduction, my initial training is as a hydrogeologist. I'm trained as a scientist. So scientists ask, OK, that's nice. There's going to be wars. What's the evidence? What do we know? Well, this is what we didn't know. We didn't even know how many international basins there were. People were saying these six, these six. There had to be more than six. 
It took us two and a half years to make this map to find out that there's more than six. There's way more than six. There's 276 international basins. Half the land surface of the earth, 40% of the world's population, and 80% of the world's fresh water originates in basins that are shared by two or more countries. So N, if you will, is way bigger than six. And the interesting thing, the question then is asked, if people are talking about those six, and there's 276, what's happening in the rest of the basins? So if there's a, a spectrum of things that countries can do to each other, from go to war to nothing, to cooperate, what's going on in the rest of the world? We had no idea. And as we started to look, my, my initial uh, work was in the Jordan Basin and found a whole history of, of secret cooperation and then explicit cooperation. E Indians and Pakistanis, after they had conflicted, they had signed a treaty that had survived two wars. So you start to look and, and start to understand, start to ask, what's really going on? So we set out what ended up becoming the Transboundary Freshwater Dispute Database, uh, just collecting stuff. Collecting all the world's treaties. There's 500 treaties uh, in the world. There's um, uh, negotiating notes, annotated bibliographies. What we did that was probably most valuable in understanding this was we, we went back in the last 60 years. We took every news uh, source, every conflict database, every gray literature reference we had to any time two countries did anything to each other. We captured it, and we coded it, and we put it along that spectrum of conflict to cooperation. So this is what our database looks like, the date, the base, and the countries, what it was about, and how uh, intent it is along this spectrum, from very intense cooperation to warfare on the other side. And this is, if there's any figure that, that, um, that people know about me and my work, it's this one. Because we counted stuff. That's our, our big contribution. And interestingly, the story starts to get really interesting when you do that, when you count things, when you look at the evidence. On this spectrum, right off the bat, you notice that two-thirds of the time countries do anything over water, it's cooperate. And these are the same countries that people were pointing to as conflicting. They would say, look, India and Pakistan, they, they, got, they had tensions in 1948. And then they signed a treaty. And that treaty's kind of held for the last 60 years, even though they fought two wars in the midst of that treaty. None of that's in the record. All this history of cooperation, same with Israelis and Arabs, Armenians and Azeris, all the same people that are conflicting and, and having tensions are also cooperating. On the conflict side, 80% of conflict recorded is verbal conflict. That means either a politician says there's going to be a war or a, or a journalist writes there's going to be a war. Right? Now, we know in the United States it never happens, but in some parts of the world, politicians lie. <laughs> right? When a politician says, we're going to go to war over water, the first question you ask is, who's the politician talking to? Who's the politician talking to? Is it the neighbor? No, talking to their own constituents. And what does that mean? We're going to go to war? Vote for me in November, right? If you actually look, were troops mobilized? Did, were the reserves called up? Did anybody point anything at, at somebody else? Did anybody fire anything at somebody else? Answer is yes, 38 times in the last 60 years. 38 times. 27 of these are between Israelis and Arabs. Which is interesting because the last shot fired on the Jordan over water was in 1970. So that's the worst case scenario. In 1968, people in the Jordan Basin ran out of water. Ran out. Demand hit supply in 1968. 1970, the last shots fired. Everything that's happened since then, wars, intifadas, population growth, economic growth, all the things that have happened have happened in the absence of violence. And that's really interesting. That starts to, to, to really get, kind of get the juices going. How is that possible? How do people do that? They ran out of water. Well, the interesting thing is when we project that people who run out of water, therefore, are going to fight, we forget, oh, yeah, there's human creativity. 
Oh, yeah, when you run out of stuff, you treat it like scarcity. Oh, yeah, when you need something badly, you learn to cooperate over it. In terms of wars in the last 60 years, none. Not in the last 100 years, not in the last 1,000 years. There's one water war on record in 2500 BC between the city-states of Lagash and Uma on the Tigris Basin, which then led to the first water treaty ever, which is cool. It, it's hang, the reason I know about the water treaty, it hangs, it's hanging in the, in the Louvre. Anybody been to the Louvre in Paris? Right? Do you remember seeing the water treaty? Of course you don't. So, the, the, so somebody caught, you know, I'm doing all this work and somebody took a picture and sent it to me and I thought, oh, this is cool. We're going to include it in a, in a book. I figured the copyright must have expired uh, long ago. Um, but then the, the publisher wrote back, they said, well, it's in cuneiform, right? You guys have seen cuneiform, right? Little scratches that look like that. It's like they, they wrote back and said, this is nice, but which way is up? <laughs> I, I didn't know. So this, this now starts getting us into a place. We get that water creates tension, but then we get that this tension leads to dialogue, to discussion, to sometimes formal negotiation, sometimes informal negotiation, sometimes to one of the 500 water treaties that have been signed in the last 60 years. And that's interesting. Moreover, the institutions that are crafted in these negotiations turn out to be really resilient over time, even as countries fight over other issues. So the picnic table talks, this is 1955, 57, uh, between, um, uh, no, 53 to 55, Israel and, and uh, Jordan. They come to a, a secret agreement on the Yarmouk River, which lasts through two wars, two intifadas, the entire time they negotiate over flows of the river. The Mekong Committee uh, is established in 1957. Survives, survives Vietnam War, bombing in Cambodia, the entire time they're exchanging uh, water data. Indus River Commission is established in 1960. Not only survives two wars, but in the middle of, of one of the wars, India makes payments to Pakistan as part of their uh, treaty obligations. And now if you go around the world, the Caucasus, uh, Southern Africa, uh, when people won't talk about anything else, oftentimes they're willing to talk about water. So now the kind of paradigm that, that I've gotten used to is this concept of water as a vehicle for dialogue. Water, call it environmental peacemaking or environmental peace building. Water gets people into the room and gives them uh, uh, language to discuss uh, their shared future. So Kofi Annan, who predicted wars, a year later also suggested uh, the water problems need not only be a cause of tension, they can also be a catalyst for cooperation. If we work together, a secure and sustainable water future can be ours. That's not what I want to talk about. Like I said, this is half of what I do. It's counting stuff. We have a huge GIS uh, database where we look at early warning indicators, indicators of future conflict, things that uh, people can do to, to identify uh, places of tension before the tension uh, breaks out. The other half of what I do, as I say, is in the room as a mediator and facilitator. And um, in that role, um, I'm trained, like, like any mediators, facilitators, people trained in ADR? Yep. Here? Southern? Yes, another Oregonian. We're all about conflict resolution. We're so groovy. <laughs> Um, you do have a program here. <laughs> yes, you do. Then, yeah. Okay. So Matt McKinney is involved in that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so most of us who are trained in this come somewhere. The lineage is from the Harvard School. Anybody heard of the book Getting to Yes, Fisher and Uri? Yeah. Okay, so, so the, the idea is that there's what we call alternative dispute resolution. And it's a, it's a fairly rational way to separate the people from the problem and identify shared interest and, and something for mutual gain. That's really, really good at a, first, at a first cut. But then the problem is, is it's rational. How many people have ever been in a conflict? <laughs> Let me ask it another way. How many people have ever been in a relationship? <laughs> Right, so you're in, a, you're in a conflict with somebody whom you love. Is there anything rational about the process? No, <laughs> right? So if you're sitting here in the back of your mind to separate the people from the problem, it's like, what? She's my wife. How do I separate her? It, this, is, this is the issue. Not that she... 
<laughs> I just realized we have on tape me saying my wife is the problem. This is a, <laughs> it's a total disclaimer there. Um, the point is the rational model gets you so far. And it's really useful as a tool. And, and people use like DSS, decision support systems, and computer models, and, and the idea. The problem with it is, is the logic. If, what people in that world say is that people will, will agree when it's in their interest to agree. And so the scientists in you ask, OK, how do you know it was in their interest to agree? What's the answer? They agreed. Right? What do we call that? That's a tautology, absolute circular logic. Right? You can't prove something's going to happen except that it happened. Right? So if not the rational model, then what happens is in these processes, you, you get involved in the negotiation. And you notice that instead of rational processes that you can, you can kind of measure, instead they're transformative moments. Okay? Where, for example, this is a kind of process-oriented model that um, uh, Jay Rothman uh, um, listed years ago in the, in the early 90s. He talks about process. Anybody been involved in a stakeholder process about anything? Doesn't have to be about water. Kind of civil, OK, a couple of folks, right? So you walk in, right? People initially are adversarial, right? The first thing you have to do, you have to vent, you have to speak, you have to shout, you have to. It's outward energy, right? And at some point, somebody listens. And that's a transformative moment. Somebody says, whoa, that's, what, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. And the interesting thing is when one person listens, it's contagious. When one person listens, other people start to listen. And once you're listening, you can start to reflect on each other and move into what he calls the reflexive stage. And then you may be able to work together in an integrative stage and come up with an action plan where you go out of the room and take what you've agreed out into, out into the world. It's kind of idealized. But the point about this is it's not rational. It's a process that fits and starts. But the movement is transformative. How many people have been in a room when suddenly everybody in the room got something different? Well, hands way up high. A lot of people. What was it? Can you, t can you talk about it? No. <laughs> can you? No. no. Anybody? Who else had the oh, No, I didn't have my hand up. OK, so the people who have been get it, right? A lot of us have been. You've been in a classroom. All of a sudden, you're looking. It's like, whoa, I, I had never really thought of it that way, right? The transformative moments. And so this is what really started to get me interested. In the water world, those kind of four stages move like this. People start talking about their rights. I deserve the water because I'm upstream. I deserve the water because I've been using it longest. I've been using, I deserve the water because of the Endangered Species Act or the Irrigation Act, Reclamation Act, whatever else, right? Rights-based. And then at some point in these negotiations, somebody says, it's nice that you need the water. It's nice that you, want, you deserve the water. What do you need? How much do you need for your endangered species and when? How much do you need for irrigation and when? Of what quality? That starts to get to be a much more nuanced conversation where you're moving from rights to needs. And that's a transformative moment. More recently, people start talking about their interests, moving beyond water entirely, thinking about the benefits that water brings and how you might uh, think about sharing the benefits. And finally, at the end of the day, you have to think about equity, right? If you think more in pictures uh, like I do, these are the four stages. You start off with the world the way it is, with its boundaries, with the things that separate us, with the rights. And then you take the boundaries off the map, right? Oh my gosh, the Columbia doesn't end at the 49th parallel, right? Goes into BC. And they have the headwaters. Um, this is a transformative moment. I've been, I've been in rooms where people have seen their base and for the first time without boundaries, and people are taken aback. They can't see themselves. All they see is this kind of broader ephemeral entity. Next thing, these are cornucopias. You think about the benefits. Where can you do things that would benefit people? And what are the benefits? Uh, where would they accrue? But then the last thing you have to do, because we have to protect our, our constituencies, is put the boundaries back on the map and make sure the benefits are allocated equitably. And we do this with Canada. We did it in 1964 treaty. We looked at two sets of benefits. What are they? 1964 hydropower and flood control, quantified them, came up with a number divided by two downstream US benefits more than Canada. So we cut them a check. 
cut them a check 30 years ago, and we cut them another check every year for the difference in benefits, right? We conveniently ignored native rights, ecosystem health, all kinds of other things, but those were the values at the time. That's the process, right? Kind of idealized. The point about this is it gets you away from trying to think in rational terms, which you know comes up against its limits, and instead thinking about the process of transformation. And so I was playing with this, um, these two images of a friend of mine at the World Bank. We were looking at these two images, and I, I was talking to him about this moment. It was actually in the Senegal Basin where we did this. All we did was we took the basins off the map, and you felt it. You felt like a, a, a jolt in the room when, where people just suddenly stood up different when they saw their basin. And uh, talking about these moments of transformation that we all feel when we're in a room where, where this thing happens. And so the interesting thing um, is if you're, if you're looking for, if you, again, you're a scientist and you want to think about transformative moments, where do you go? If you ask people when they've had profound transformative moments in their life, when does this happen to people? You whispered, say it out loud. In the classroom, total transformation. That's why you're in college, right? Every day, every moment is another transformative moment, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, in the classroom it happens. Where else does it happen? When your beliefs are challenged. When your beliefs are challenged, right? Belief systems are challenged. Boom. Whoa. Right? Now, what do you do oftentimes when you feel the challenge? What are you going to do? Fight back. Fight back. Hell yes. Right? Or you'll listen. Right? Two totally different tactics. Okay? Your beliefs are challenged. Where else? Portland, <laughs> yeah, Portland's one long transformative moment, <laughs> you bet. Um, how about, uh, sorry? You can trust people, and all of a sudden it opens up to new possibilities, right? Any parents in a room? Transformative moments? <laughs> yeah, there it is, right? One moment you're the center of the universe, the next thing, you're irrelevant, right? Feed me, change me, I don't care. You and your PhD, right? <laughs> and he's changing, right? Total transformative moment. Or God forbid, somebody gets sick, right? All of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I should be paying more attention to my family. I should be paying more attention to my health, right? So the interesting thing is he, I start to get interested in these moments, and there's nowhere to go for, to study those moments. Where do you go to study? Well, I'm, I'm looking at these images with this guy, and he he's, works for the World Bank. He's as, as, as left-brained as you get, an economist, engineer, um, and also a practicing Baha'i. And he says, you know what? That looks an awful lot like a metaphor for spiritual transformation. He says, isn't that what spiritual traditions try and do, is take you from where you are with your boundaries, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I have all these needs, and try and get you to think more broadly without the boundaries on the map about your relationship to whatever you relate to. If it's humanity or energy or the divine, whatever it is, that's what they do. Wouldn't it be interesting, we said, to think about that systematically? Go to people who practice spiritual transformation and see if there isn't something that we could learn to help us do our job in the negotiating room better. Very rational question, right? Ask in the scientific method. And so we do what academics do. We had a meeting, right? We had, this was really cool. This was Vatican Science Council, right? Oregon State University, Pacific Institute, Peter Glick, whom you may have heard of, and the Vatican Science Council. How many people know the Vatican has a science council? A couple of people. I didn't know. I thought it was a contradiction in terms, right? <laughs> Uh, but apparently the Vatican at some point had some problems with Galileo or something and, and um, the whole, and, and now their position, the church's position is if science has, if science comes to an understanding that's contrast to the church's teaching, it's the church's teaching that has to change. That's kind of interesting. So we have this meeting in Vatican City. How many people have been to the Vatican? Also very cool. How many people have been to the private part of the Vatican? Ha <laughs> So this is what's cool. <laughs> this is, so you, you know like out, you've all seen Dan Brown movies, right? And you see out where all the public is and all the museums and everything. And then you go, you, you try and go past the museums and then who's standing there keeping you out? 
Swiss guards, right? Swiss guards in Renaissance uniform with, I don't even know what they're called, like a half sword, half hatchet thing, right? Scary thing, right? Well, if you're with the Vatican Science Council and you're one of their meetings, you stay in the hostel that's built for the cardinals, right? When the Pope passes away, the cardinals have to come and congregate. They need a place to stay. Well, when the Pope isn't passing away, there's this big, beautiful, empty building <laughs> that's used for meetings that um, it's, it's astonishing. I, you're staying in the room, right? No 50 channels, 500 channels, no internet connection. The softest sheets you've ever experienced in your life. <laughs> I didn't want to get out of bed. It's like, I don't, I don't care about this meeting. It was, it was, but the coolest part is you're out there with all the, the hoi polloi in the front of the of Vatican, and then you walk by and you take your, ho your hostel key and you flash it to the Swiss guard, and they pull back the, their scabbard sword thing and they salute you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's neither here nor there. The point is, what we had at, at this meeting was we brought together um, leaders from uh, different spiritual communities uh, and uh, people who had negotiated water uh, treaties at a very high level. Brought together for three days and it was wildly unsuccessful, unproductive. In three days, the languages were just too, too different. It was as if one side of the brain's talking to the other, but it's severed. Right? So on the one hand, you have you know, the, the, the water people, they're all engineers, and, and I mean, they're all way left brain. And then in, on contrast, you have like this Sufi master who's just like almost literally glowing. You just want to sit next to him because he's just oozing good vibes. And, and there's no common language. Um, so what we did, what, we, what did come out of it was a series of really useful questions. Um, and around two sets of, of issues. One is this idea of understanding conflict. Within spiritual traditions, how do you understand things like conflict, things like anger, things like evil? And how do you create moments, right? That's the second set of questions, these process techniques. What are the, how do you craft moments or the settings where transformation uh, can, if it's, if it's ready, can thrive? So two things happened simultaneously that, that uh, then led to what I'm about to talk about. One uh, is I got tenure. So I couldn't be fired for asking these questions, which is really useful. Uh, and two, I got a sabbatical, which meant that I could spend a year traveling the world, mostly in the Middle East and, and Southeast Asia, uh, and hanging out with people who deal with transformation as, as part of what they do. Uh, and again, a purely utilitarian exercise. What can, what can we learn in our little negotiation world that may, that may be useful? So I'll give you some example of the kinds of things that come out of it. And there's a, there's a lot, as you, as you can imagine. Um, the first thing is this idea of, of four stages and, and, and a, a, a shift, if you will, in energy from each of the stages. These are the three that we've talked about. And here's another, another set, another sequence. Anybody recognize this last sequence? People are whispering, it doesn't help. You gotta yell out. Say it again. Anybody? Hierarchy of needs, who's hierarchy of needs? Maslow's, right? Abraham Maslow, how many people have heard of him? Hierarchy of needs, right? Inner to outer. Uh, you start off starting thinking about what you need to get through the day, your physical needs, then your emotional needs, finally uh, intellectual and spiritual needs. Absolutely. Where else have you seen this? Well, when you start looking, it's almost everywhere. It's in Sufism as four lenses through which to see the world. It's in most indigenous traditions as uh, four uh, levels uh, through which one sees the world. If you think in, in from uh, lower to upper, you see them in chakras. You see them in Kabbalah. You see them in Christian uh, exegesis, where every word of text has four meanings, from its most apparent to its most uh, secret. Uh, I know it from uh, the four levels of holiness that Moses went through as he went up uh, Mount Sinai. Um, which then, the temple in Jerusalem uh, was supposed to be a recreation of that path uh, that Moses went through from outer uh, chambers to the Holy of Holies, the inner chamber. Um, anybody been to Angkor Wat? 
Cambodia. Same structure from outer to inner and upward to an empty space uh, uh, representing the mystical uh, at the top. Um, the, the, interestingly, the, when the temple was destroyed, uh, that guided meditation through these four levels was put in the Jewish prayer service uh, that religious Jews say three times a day, a guided meditation directly through each of these four levels, which brings us to the question, what was Abraham Maslow's tradition? He was Jewish. He stole his hierarchy from God. <laughs> No attribution, no citation, no nothing. He must, he must have been exposed, exposed to this. Three times a day, people go through very, very explicitly. So that's kind of interesting. What does it have to do with water? If you get that this is a universal construct that most people can tap into, you see this start to happen in water negotiations. For example, oh, I, sorry, give you, there's your, your hierarchy of needs. Uh, Maslow, here's your chart that's looks like it had a conflict between Macs and PCs. But it, this basically says every tradition you look at in the world has Buddhism, four jhanas, four noble truths, each one from the physical, from the lower, all the way, uh, all the way through the, the upper. Um, so in water, uh, take uh, Israel, and, and is, Israel and, and its neighbors started to negotiate water in the, in the early 1990s. And Israel walked in saying, uh, we don't want to talk about history. We don't want to talk about uh, rights. We want to look towards the future. We're all out of water. We're only going to talk about allocations. We'll talk about the future. And the Palestinians said, well, of course we're all out of water. You stole our water. We're not going to talk about the future until you talk about the past. Recognize our rights our historic rights, and then we'll talk with you about our future. And they lock. It's gridlock. Rights, allocations, rights, allocations. And if you understand this kind of hierarchy, you get, you, you're able to deconstruct that conversation a little bit to where for the um, Palestinians, when they're talking about water, they're talking about physical water. People in Gaza literally don't have enough for their lives and livelihoods. Literally don't. People are dying because of the water quality in Gaza. If you're dying because you don't have enough water, it's very difficult to talk about things like greater agricultural efficiency. Or the Palestinians were talking about water as emotional water. Water representing sovereignty. Water representing the Israeli hand on their tap. Water representing the lack of control. For the Israelis, this was an intellectual exercise. How much water can we move from agriculture, use it more efficiently, and put it into industry? And if you get that, that they're all using the word water at different levels, you're then able to construct a conversation that moves through these needs in sequence. Let's start with basic human needs. Can we agree that Israelis and Palestinians all need the same amount to drink? Yes. And you move upward from, uh, from there. It's actually in a, in a meeting, uh, let's talk about spiritual water here, here uh, anywhere in the West, uh, where the tribes are reminding us regularly that all water is spiritual water. And, so you're, and this is true all over the indigenous world. So if you go, if you go to Hopi, for example, and you, and you hear this conversation, can we use the water from your sacred spring to move our coal slurry, you understand the real disconnect going on between meanings of water in a very technical way. So I was in a meeting where a, an engineer was very frustrated at the lack of progress. He says, what is this spiritual water? Water is water. I said, just out of curiosity, what's, what's your tradition? He says, well, I'm Catholic. I said, so just out, out of curiosity, if you, if you had a problem with the, the, the toilet in your church, would you use the holy water from the front to help clear it? He said, no, no, that's whole, oh. <laughs> Right? We get it, but we haven't really thought about it systematically enough to put it into use. So we, I was in a meeting with the Israelis and Palestinians where we were dealing, we, we, everybody walked into the room agreeing that they were going to talk about needs. Well, what needs are important? This one contributes more to GDP. This one is more important for survival. This one, well, we went back to first principles, right? The first, the highest priority that everybody in the room agreed to, and this was a transformative moment, was what? Drinking and, not sanitation, drinking and spiritual. Yep. Drinking water and spiritual 
We're given the highest priority. And think what a moment that is when, first of all, through drinking water, the Israelis had to recognize that they owed the Palestinians water because they were using more personally than the Palestinians. And that just, according to the structure, doesn't make sense. But also the fact that they had to recognize the legitimacy of the other person's spiritual needs. Right? That was a transformative moment. And then from there, it was easy, relatively easy, to move through uh, the rest. Uh, what kind of agriculture? Well, only subsistence agriculture. Subsistence agriculture and subsistence industry. Subsistence is subsistence. Then, ecosystems that are in danger of co imminent collapse. Then, industry, industrial agriculture and industry. And then, greater ecosystem health. Right? So once that falls into place, we're moving through this, and people, because it's fairly universal, some people have suggested we're hardwired to see the world through these four lenses, uh, it, it works out to be a fairly universal uh, language. You all with me so far? OK, we're going to go a little over, because I have to. <laughs> we're going to go deeper. Where's my geographers? Geographers, one. <laughs> one and two, yay, three. Only faculty, no students? So geographers, yeah? All right. So geographers love maps, right? And we will map absolutely anything. This isn't my map. This is a map of God's consciousness, according to Kabbalah. And the way Kabbalah looks at the world is there are 10 uh, spheres, 10 uh, divine attributes, spheres of divine attributes that exist in the universe. Grace flows from the world above to the world below. Um, I'm starting to lose you. The way you. Uh, increase the amount of grace as you align your will with God's will. Doesn't matter. Trust me. Okay? It's, it's, and because, the, because in this construct, the, the map of the universe is also the map, or the map of God's consciousness is also the map of the universe, and also the map of our own consciousness because our consciousness is in created. Any real Kabbalist would, would, would have killed me long ago. Um, but the, what, what I want to focus on is also a fairly universal construct right in the heart of this, of this model. This idea of a balance between what's called deen, justice, and chesed, which is mercy, openness. So if you think about, one, the way our brain works, there's left brain that's the, that's the rational, that's the linear, that's the closed, that's the bounded, and right brain, uh, right brain which is the open, which is the uh, um, bounded, Bounded, boundless, boundless, open, <laughs> whatever. Um, if you think about any dichotomy that we have, it has echoes of this, of this construct. If we think about politics, right, the politics of self-determination uh, and, and bringing yourself up by the bootstraps versus the politics of a safety net, the politics of the openness. In, in the world of rationality versus spirituality. Uh, the world of, of justice, if we think about our justice system, there's justice locking people up, and there's uh, mercy. There's the idea that somehow there's a broader responsibility that we all bear when somebody uh, errs. So the idea is that these two sit in balance. Uh, and, in, in, and this is where the, the concept of the enlightenment rift uh, is, is important to explain. In the Enlightenment in the 18th century, what we did, particularly in the, in the balance of spirituality and rationality, is we severed that link. Those two were always thought of two parts of the same whole up until, up until 17th, 18th century. And the Enlightenment, we said, and it was for very legitimate political and, and re religious reasons, uh, but we basically said in public discourse, we're going to focus on rationality. We can talk about absolutely anything as long as we can assign a number to it. If we can measure it, it's open for public discourse. If you can't measure it, if it's part of the spiritual world, you can do it, but away from the public. You do it at home with your family. You do it in your Friday, Saturday, or Sunday community elsewhere. And so this gets to a place where if you think about our public discourse and the way we see the world, this is a, a, a myopia, not myopia. We're trying to see um, perception, not perception. What's it called? You need two eyes to see. Got to yell out. 
percep depth perception, right? We're trying to see depth perception with one eye closed, right? So when we, we go around, think about our, our, our model of justice, for example. Lock them up. There is no concept that it has to be balanced with mercy, right? In a lot of the world, when somebody errs, the whole community is erred. It's not just the criminal that's responsible, the community is responsible. When somebody's sick, I, I know people in public health in, in the developing world, when one person's sick, the community's sick. They don't understand this concept that you just have to look after the single person, right? The balance of self and other. If you look at our, our, our uh, conflict resolution, we're all about rights. We're all about individual rights. We're so proud of what we've accomplished in individual rights, our democracy, our, our right to free speech, our right to vote, our right, this is great. But it's never balanced with the discussion of the responsibilities, right? And so in conflict resolution, we focus on that. We focus on the rational, we focus on the rights. And if somebody errs, we lock them up, right? We have closed off this lobe, if you will, or this, or this way of seeing the world. And the important thing to remember is this is only a Western construct and a relatively recent Western construct. The rest of the world, how many people have traveled internationally? How many people who've traveled internationally are a little put off or a little surprised by how often the rest of the world talks about God and spirituality and religion? It's a little jarring, right? We don't notice that we don't do it until all of a sudden. So when we go with our water projects and we say, we're gonna give you money to build your, your diversion or your agricultural station or whatever it is, and these are the metrics that we want you to follow, and these are the things that we want you to measure, and these are the milestones that we want you to meet. They're all about the things that we think matter because we can measure them. Well, we're missing this stuff that's important to a lot of the world. What's a, the relationship within our community? What about our spiritual lives? What about our religious lives? What about all these other things that you're never, ever going to mention? So we have to recognize, I think, that we're, we're walking in this very, very narrow path, and it's a recent path, and it's a, it's a Western path. Now, what's it have to do with conflict resolution? A lot. In conflict resolution, in a lot of the world, it's not just about justice or rights, it's about the balance of self and community. So in, in throughout the Middle East, there's a, the, a concept of a sulha. When somebody does something wrong, it's a ceremony of forgiveness. They come to the family that they've wronged under a white flag and with the, the village elders, and they ask for forgiveness from the family that they've wronged. I took power from you when I wronged you, and I now give you the power back to decide whether I, I, I can be brought back into the community, where, where the, collectively we can repair the fabric of our community. Right? There's a word in Arabic, beautiful word, tardin, resolution of a conflict that involves no humiliation. Right? Think about that. Do we have such a word? Or such, these are the people that we were going to teach democracy to, right? This is, these are really powerful concepts. And they look at us sometimes like, I don't get you, right? So recognizing that, again, within the conflict resolution setting, why is this important? In this construct, the source of anger is too much self. Think about that. The source of anger is too much self. So when do you get angry? You always focus your anger outward, right? They did that, they did that. Well, this, what this is telling you is, no, no, no. They did something, but the anger comes from within. And you start with, I'm right, then I'm righteous, then I'm self-righteous, and then I'm so self-righteous, I can bring harm or even evil to somebody else, right? That's a powerful lesson. If we think about it, and we understand how anger is a shield for our own vulnerability. So how, think about the lesson that this offers. Somebody comes at you with anger, right? What do you do naturally? You get angry back. They're attacking you. You're going to defend yourself. You need your own shield, right? Well, here's an interesting thought. What if you didn't? What if instead of meeting their anger with your anger, instead you listened? I mean, not listen like stop talking listen. I, I don't mean listen like active listen. You've heard this term active listening, right? The problem with active listening is it's active. What if you were there just for them? Listening in a way that we forgot how to teach, 
Right? How many people have ever talked to a Buddhist monk? Feel like you were the center of the universe? Right? There's a way that our, a lot of our spiritual traditions teach us how to listen that we don't ever talk about. Talk about. We don't ever do. In a classroom, this is a university. We have a course in listening? Not on mine. I took a course in listening. Ten week course. On the phone. <laughs> Still listening. There are ways to listen that transform the speaker. The interesting thing is when real anger is coming at full bore, all all out anger is coming at you, if you don't respond with anger, it can usually only last three or four minutes. And then it spends itself. And you know what comes out next? It's the vulnerability. And then you can have a conversation. I was with a group of people in the Middle East. With the, I don't know if you guys remember, there was a time uh, Israel had settlements in the Gaza Strip. And Israel was withdrawing from the Gaza Strip. And they, they tore down those settlements. They asked the settlers to come back into Israel. And it was a, a traumatic time for Israel. Whether you agree with the settlers or, or not, or whatever, whatever your political stance is, it doesn't matter. For those people who were leaving their homes, it was traumatic. And so I went with a group of people. And our whole job was to listen to uh, the people who were being asked to leave. The army was going to come and was going to, going to evict them. We knew they weren't going to go voluntarily. Um, and, and all the discourse was up here at the yelling place, so we went to, to listen. And uh, we went, and they were very gracious, took us into their home, and it launched into us. You people, you're destroying the country. You're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing the other. And you know, truth be told, I'm worried that when the army comes, I'm worried for my kids. Truth be told, I don't know what to do with my stuff when the bulldozers come to demolish the house. To be honest, I don't know how we're going to be accepted back within Green Line Israel. That was a vulnerability. Now you can have a conversation. <coughs> the group I was with wanted the people to leave, but hell, we'll watch your stuff. We'll watch your kids. Right? This works so profoundly, and we don't do it well. Seriously, the single best skill that I learned in all this, all this research was this idea of the transformative the transformative potential of listening and how badly we do it. There's a joke people tell about Americans. For an American, what's the opposite of speaking? Waiting to speak. <laughs> right? Think about it. Right? OK. Um, so the, I, I, I want to wrap up. I want to be respectful of the time. Uh, but the, the question is, I was working more and more with this model and this balance of, of these three. They come together in rachamim, which is uh, a balance, compassion, which means that you can be open and empathetic to the other side as long as you're rooted in, in your own healthy self, right? It's not just about the other side. So I started to ask, as, as I was learning more about this model, I was asking now, is this universal also? And of course, you, you see remnants, I mean, you see vestiges of it in lots of places, certainly in the way our brain works. Uh, is wrapped up in this model, but also um, if in a Christian model. Anybody see see echoes of this? Yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? So I was working with a, a monk uh, who, um, a Buddhist monk who was, he was, uh, he got into uh, mediation because his temple was in a, a forest and um, Uh, there was a lot of conflict between the government and the people that lived lived near the temple. He got into me, into uh, mediation from a very a very Buddhist uh, way, and I, I was working with him, and I, I I worked through this model with him. I said, "Is this you know from what I understand of Buddhism, it's all about you know this compassion, this idea of of metta, of of loving kindness." And uh, do you have this sense? Of, do you have also the concept? He said, "Well." Um, it's not a Buddhist concept, but it's a Taoist concept that we work with. Have, have you ever seen this? And he drew it for me. Uh, so it's, it's, the, the principle is the same, right? We see this idea of, of, of self and other. Uh, and, and once, of course, once the lines uh, come off, then you have a, a, a sense of unity. So um, working with this, um, the, last, the last set of issues, and I'm, I'm only going to go for, for two minutes more, uh, are these techniques. Each of these spiritual traditions have ways that they offer that uh, create the settings 
that are conducive to transformation. If you think about them, you know them intuitively, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna get a group of people together, what are you gonna do with them, first of all? I'm gonna eat something, because sharing a meal is a pretty special, is a pretty special act. And uh, tribes uh, around here especially have this idea of first foods, that you go through a series of foods. Um, if you're thinking about where you're gonna hold the meeting, where are you gonna hold it? Is it gonna be in the basement of the Holiday Inn? Right? Think about the surroundings, the structure, right? What if you had, the, the, what if you had your negotiations in a church? Uh, there's a group has their negotiations in a library. Because what don't you ever do in a library? <laughs> right? You don't yell in a library, right? Say, so they have right? You think about the structure. How do you do introductions, right? You can do introductions the way we do it. What's your name? What's your degree? Where are you in, your hi in our hierarchy, right? Or you can ask everybody, I was hearing a wonderful story today. Tell a story. Uh, about your relationship with water. Tell a story about uh, where your name comes from. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a hundred different ways to do introductions, drawing on this, on this uh, uh, the Hindu idea of, of, of um, um, oh, I, I lost the word, narratives, narratives. Right? The, the power, of, the power of, of, of narratives. At the end of the day, you've done your introductions. Instead of a hierarchy, you now have a sense of community. The little things that we do, how we sit. We set each other, we're normally seated in the single psychologically worst way, worst way to do it. But when we pray, do you notice how we sit? Right? No matter what tradition we're in, we take this energy and we move it into this energy. Right? It's a real energetic thing. And people who do mediation for a living, do facilitation for, for a living, they end up talking about, at some point, the energy in the room and how it's crafted and how you feel the jolts, how you feel the transformation, how you shape it. There is no rational way to, to talk about it. And the other thing that I don't know if you, if you felt or, or not, um, well, the, the, when you're, what we've learned from this is when we, see, when we see people, either in negotiations or in uh, workshops, training workshops, the people who dislike each other the most, side by side, really close. Because <laughs> you can't get angry sideways, right? You took our land. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work. But the other thing, and I, I don't know if you felt this or not, but as I came towards Matt, as, as, I, came, as I came towards you, I matched your breathing and slowed it down. And your breathing also slowed down, right? This is also something intuitive. It's, it happens to be a Buddhist meditation technique. Where's our parents again, right? Do that with your newborn, right? Up on your shoulder, the exact, we do it intuitively and then we totally forget about it. Baby's crying, match their breathing, slow it down. Right? It's also a Buddhist meditation technique. The point about all this stuff is there's an amazing host of constructs to think about things like anger and, 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 and evil and conflict. And there's an amazing host of tools that are uh, powerful beyond belief uh, that we need to learn from. Because our 200 years of trying to do it solely based on rationality uh, only get us so far. Uh, and I'm fir firmly convinced that um, uh, that we need to get back our, our uh, the vision from both both our eyes. I want to just end with this quote. I'm so sorry. You told me about the time, but it went over. Um, Massachusetts Episcopal Diocese, they reorganized their uh, diocese boundaries. They used to be uh, around political boundaries in Massachusetts, and then they put them around watershed boundaries. And this was the rationale, simply demonstrating that we're all connected by water, rich and poor, urban and rural, Upstream and down is a fine place to start. I think the Holy Spirit will take care of the rest. Thank you. So recognizing that this ends full stop at, at 8.30, we have time for questions, comments. Yeah. In your first draft, uh, showed the number of agreements and conflicts over water. Did you look at uh, prevailing weather patterns in that relatively short period? Yeah. Um, and so what's the assumption? Is that all this is getting worse because of climate change? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, we looked at a lot of indicators. There's a whole other, I mean, for, for years I was on this, uh, on this kind of quantitative, and still am to some extent, kind of looking at, at quantitative indicators of conflict. And almost nothing indicates, not weather, um, not population growth, not economic growth, not, um, can I ask y'all, I know you're getting, it's funny, students, no matter where they are, they have antennae for the end of the class. I promise at, at 8.30 sharp, I'll stop, but if you could not like shuffle your books and put on your coats and put your pencils away before then, it would help a lot because I'm, I'm kind of at the end. Um, what, indicates, what indicates is when the rate of change within a basin, so there's change, population, ec economics, whatever else is going up and down, amount of water available. And then there's the institutional capacity to absorb the change. How well the parties get on, what kind of formal or informal institutions they have, what are the laws, and how, how well do they follow the laws. If you match those two, when the rate of change exceeds the institutional capacity to absorb the change, that's when you get a conflict. And so it, everything else doesn't matter. Now you, you could easily say everything's getting worse. Populations are going up, climate change is mucking with everything. Uh, I still think the two biggest drivers of the crisis in water are the same as they've always been, population and poverty. Those are huge drivers. And I think that part I'm not optimistic about. The fact that people are suffering and dying, they'll continue to do so, they'll continue to do so at ever greater, greater numbers. The part I'm optimistic about is the, is the political transboundary uh, or transborder uh, political implications. I don't think we're going to have wars no matter how bad the hydrology gets. Uh, the, the hierarchy and the sort of progression uh, moving, starting with needs, seems to be predicated on the idea of at least some semblance of legitimacy in the other party. Um, so recognizing that that person or that party's needs are at a fundamental level legitimate, and that's not always the case. Does this still apply in those regards, or what other sort of groundwork has to be laid to establish that? Yeah, I think, uh, so the question is, if, is if, if one side doesn't recognize the other's legitimacy. So one, there's the practical answer, which is when, when I'm in the room, people have already decided who's going to be in the room. So by definition, they have some legitimacy. Who's not in the room is, is a problem oftentimes. And so where, where that's happened, um, I, think, I think the model works... That's why it's so important for people who don't have legitimacy to have their rights recognized. So you can't just blow past it and say, look, that's, that's trivial. That's what the Israelis tried to do with the Palestinians. And rights is huge. It's huge. But it can also be, it also can be fairly, um, you can eat, once it's recognized, you can easily, easily move, move past it. I think even deeper, this idea of four levels is, is universal and you can appeal to that. If you have an Israeli and a Palestinian where, where one side doesn't recognize the other side for whatever reason, they each still recognize that they have these four ways of seeing the world. And that you can appeal to absolutely. Right? Yeah. I'm curious how um, this message has been received by um, scientists with conventional ideas about <laughs> it. <laughs> Are you saying I'm not conventional? <laughs> So, yeah, I do. So, so what do you think? I mean, why, why are you asking the question? Well, I guess because I'm, I'm in the environmental humanities, so I'm really interested in narrative uh -huh. and the human experience in these issues. Yeah. But um, I think it's, it's often not seen as, as legitimate as, as the kind of um, scientific science. Yep. And, and that's, that's what I do to trick them, is I point out why they don't see it as legitimate. This is our problem. Now, I don't know if you listened carefully to this very generous uh, introduction I have. I'm the chair of the Department of Geosciences in the College of Science at a land grant, sea grant, space grant university. Right? I'm as rational as you get. This is a rational process. And this is, as a scientist, this is where you go. And this is, this is where, I mean, I, I'm not speaking facetiously. I went to this as a scientist. I got as far as I could with the rational model, and I couldn't go any farther. And as a scientist, I had to go where the evidence goes. The evidence led me to transformative moments. As a scientist, it's incumbent on me to follow that path. Understand transformation. If I didn't, I would be a lousy scientist. Right? Now, uh, yeah, please. I, it seems to me like you've got the both sides of the brain, the feminine and masculine. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you mean in my model. <laughs> 
using that for conflict resolution. Right. That's right. What about the concept of value? You have to have the same values to begin as to both sides. Yeah. I mean, if you have a yeah. water. Oh, I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, so one of the ways, it's a, it's a really good point. Interestingly, feminine and masculine isn't what you think in the Kabbalistic model. The bounded, the closed, the justice, that's the feminine. The feminine is the one that, that draws the boundaries, right? Um, and it, it's, 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 so it's not always as intuitive as, as, as one might think. But you're right, there is a balance also between, uh, uh, between feminine and, and, and masculine. Um, Values. So one way of thinking of this also, when we're in negotiations, we're taught to separate um, positions from interests, right? Positions from interests. And, and you've heard this, right? It's not a question of, of what people want, it's why they want it, right? That's the interest behind why does somebody farm? If they farm to make a living, you can have one set of conversation about buying out the water during drought years. If they're farming because it's their lifestyle and, and, and this is what they do and it's their identity, it's another conversation, right? The deeper, the underlying the interest is values. And if you can steer a conversation towards that, as you get deeper and deeper into these levels, you end up with fewer and fewer distinctions. So offhand, you have a group of, of hardcore environmentalists and, and hardcore developers, right, in a room. And you picture them in your mind. Which one cares about a healthy environment? Which one? Both of them. Which one cares about a healthy economy? Both of them, right? As you really get, who cares about good school systems for their kids? A safe environment for their house. As you get deeper and deeper to core values, we share more and more and more. And so that's this process. People have heard the term reframing, right? So if you invite people to a meeting on how, how, how should we get that water back in the stream for salmon, that's a divisive question right up front. It's a very, very narrow question. If instead you ask the values question, how do you see our community around the watershed in the next 20 years, that's a more inclusive question, right? Let the values lead. And even deeper than values, I think, is this, is this underlying unity that where people really do see a connection uh, to each other. Really good question. Thank you. Nobody's going to say, aren't religions the source of the world's problems? <laughs> somebody always, I mean, every single time I've done this talk, somebody has said something along those lines. Who's thinking that? But wait a second, isn't religion the problem? Nobody? Okay, I'll answer it anyway. Does, okay, so <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, kind of. So, uh, and, and I, I, I didn't get a chan chance to distinguish in, in the talk. And notice I really didn't use the word religion at all. I used the word spiritual and spiritual tradition because the, there, is a, there is a difference, right? If you think about, if you think about spirituality as kind of um, transcendence, right? People, whether they're religious or not, get transcendence. People have almost always felt a moment of transcendence at one time or another in their life. It might be in a religious setting or it might be in a museum or it might be reading poetry or it might be wherever it is. At some point, it might be mountain climbing or bike riding or whatever it is. At some point you get a, a sense of a greater connection, right? And so if you take all of that collectively, that's what I think of as, as spirituality. Now around that came religion which it, at its best provides a venue vehicle towards spirituality, but at its worst, because it's, it's made by people, has all the politics and egos and, and all the detriment. So we all know people who are spiritual without being religious, right? And we all know religious people who aren't particularly spiritual, right? So I made that distinction. Thank you for thinking that question. <laughs> Anything else? So just leave you with this. Uh, if you don't take anything away, anything else away, um, take this exercise away. If somebody's coming at you with anger, especially somebody you love, try those two things. Try and sit next to them and try and listen and see if it doesn't shape the entire rest of the discussion. Thank you, guys. Thank you.